thanks for coming today. Uh, excited to have everyone here. I just wanted to um, welcome you all to the briefing session for evaluating and monitoring for impact, developing a framework for risk prevention programs. Uh, before I get really stuck into how it's going to work today, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the um, traditional custodians of all the lands we're dialing in from today. I imagine it's quite a diverse, or I know it's a diverse team we've got in the room. So I'm dialing in from Yaga and Turtle Land, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present, and emerging, and that these lands were never ceded. And uh, I feel very lucky. I live here near the Mianjin River, um, and in an area that's been less developed over time. So I get to walk along the river and appreciate this beautiful country that um, has been maintained by traditional custodians for uh, uh, tens of millennia. So, um, and always like to, we always like an HRA to take a moment to, um, to reflect on those traditional custodians. Welcome again to the session today. Um, just a, a couple of, um, couple of points before we get started. So what we're covering today is we'll do a quick introductions to who you'll be hearing from in the briefing. Um, a little bit about NHRA. Uh, a lot of you will know us already, so it's not, we won't spend too long on that. But really what we want to spend time on is the project background and objectives and the project components. So we're lucky enough to be joined by um, uh, a lot of the end user agencies today who can speak a bit more to what the programs are and how the different work packages fit together. And I'll explain a bit about that as well. Um, and before going into a bit of the sort of nuts and bolts of the governance reporting and the EOI process. But the real aim of the game is we don't want to um, reiterate a lot of stuff that's already in EOI, but there is actually quite a lot of richness behind the two programs in particular that you'd be looking to evaluate um, that um, is better, best coming from the end users themselves. So um that's the overall flow of the session so a bit more housekeeping before we get into that one is that we'll be recording the session and that recording will be shared through the website for the eui the reason for that is as part of our procurement we need to make sure that any questions that are asked and there will be a hopefully a lengthy process or a lengthy bit of time at the end just to give you an opportunity to ask your questions we need to make sure that um, other researchers have an opportunity to look at those answers as well. So sharing this recording is a really critical part of that, making sure it's a level playing field. Um, and I will be inviting everyone, uh, the, the speakers today to introduce themselves a bit more. Um, but I would also encourage, what I would say, sorry, with the recording, please, um, if you don't feel comfortable being on the recording, feel free to keep your video off. And I still encourage you to ask your questions using the chat or however you feel comfortable doing so. If you don't feel comfortable with either of those things, you still have questions that you wanted to ask, you can always email them to us. But bearing in mind, we'll still publish any questions that we receive on the website. Um, but the, the second bit of housekeeping is we run these so you can get um, a good understanding or a better understanding of the project so you prepare your expression of interest. The other reason is we also, in particular with this project, because there's a number of different components, it's a good opportunity for you to uh, introduce yourselves to other research parties that might be interested. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as we go through. I'll be inviting everyone to introduce themselves shortly. But while we're doing that, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, share details and flag if you're interested in potentially submitting a consortium bid on this one. Um, but looking forward to getting into it. I'll just introduce myself a bit more. I'm George Goddard. I'm the Node Research, a Node Research Manager. There's several. There's a couple in this room at the moment. Um, at uh, Natural Hazards Research Australia. I, I predominantly work on the DECA and CFA um, programs, but also do a lot on core projects such as this one as well. So this is my first briefing. So on the core program. So bear with me if I stuff anything up. Really lovely to meet you all. I only joined NHRA a few months back and I've come across from the international development sector. So I'm learning a lot as I go. And it's really exciting to be working on this particular project just because I've got quite a strong background on monitoring and evaluation and learning in the international development space. So it's really interesting to see where there are gaps or similarities or opportunities that mirror across from one to the other. Um, so that's me. I won't speak too much about myself, but that was probably enough already. 
I might um, just hand over to one of our other speakers, Kamara, today, who will be introducing us to the Wi-Fi Captive Portals. Kamara, are you happy just to say a bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Thanks, George. Um, hi, everyone. So I live and work on Gundungurra country, which is Southern Highlands, New South Wales. I've been an operational firefighter with Fire and Rescue New South Wales for 12 years, um, but I studied and worked as a researcher externally to the brigade. So I gained my PhD in 2018 um, and worked for Queensland University of Technology, as well as some contract work for WADFES and Australian Institute of Criminology. Um, and then three years ago, started working as a researcher within Fire and Rescue New South Wales. Um, and I predominantly develop, implement and evaluate community risk reduction programs. And I also conduct research and data analysis to inform evidence but based decision-making kind of more broadly, um, but predominantly within the emergency and disaster prevention and preparedness space. And uh, my project that I'm presenting today has been designed uh, in collaboration with Mark Owens from CFA Victoria. I'm not sure if Mark's able to uh, introduce himself today, but Mark and I have worked really closely on, on the project that we're gonna be presenting today. Thanks, George. Thanks, Kamara. Um... And I might just hand next to, I know Mark's dadding as well as attending, so I might hand over to Chris, but Mark will hopefully have a chance during the Q&A to, to say hi. But Chris, um, Chris Clark, are you happy to introduce yourself and your colleagues that you have in the office there today? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, hi, good day. My name's Chris Clark. I'm the manager of the Q Community Engagement Unit with Queensland Fire and Emergency Service. I've been a fiery since 2008, so it's at 15 years roughly. Um, I'm a substantive station officer and I've come into this role. I've been in here about two and a half years now. Uh, this is Jimmy Thorburn, hey. um, a substantive senior fiery. He's a current state coordinator for the Triple F program and the RAP program. We, wrote a road, we, we run a road safety program as well. Um, and Clancy May, she's our program officer who, um, administrative officer, provides support to our programs um, throughout that. Um, yeah, we're really excited about this piece of work and, and really excited to share some of the um, some of our program with you and help help you understand what we're here for and what we can do to work together. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris and team. Lovely to have you all here. So um, and thanks for taking a moment to introduce yourselves again with the research researchers that are on online today. Please feel free to introduce yourselves via the chat um, as we go through. And if you do feel comfortable sharing your details, please do so. So before we dive into the meat of the project, just for those of you that are, are less familiar with Natural Hazards Research Australia, we um, this new round of the centre commenced in the first on the first of July, twenty twenty one. It's uh, eighty five billion dollars a year over ten years um, from the Commonwealth, so through an, an agreement with uh, DISA, uh, with top up contributions from various partners at state and local level as well, including other end user groups. Um, I won't spend too long on it, but ultimately our core objective is to see and deliver and facilitate research that really helps build community resilience to the natural hazards they're experiencing in a given context. So really about protecting human life and minimizing harm and suffering, contributing to developing and supporting well-prepared and resilient communities, and investing in research to translate into action. That's really core. It's one of the things that really attracted me, to be honest, to NHRA when I was applying with on the fact that when we generate knowledge that can have impact on the way we can do things differently how we can do things better and um, that's very much a core commitment of natural hazards research australia and that really runs through all of the work we do and that's why you see really heavy end user involvement different agencies getting involved helping brief um the different projects that emerge and that's why we've got a great representation today so thanks for being here team to help explain more about your aspirations for this particular project so going to a bit more about the project i'm not going to go too far into it because i'm going to let um i'm going to let uh Kamara and chris and team um, talk to this a bit more themselves but the project is not a program but a, quite a big project or a bloody big project as we were calling it um it has three different components to it so three work packages um, and they all sort of feed together. So one uh, core component of the first work package is the evaluation of the fight fire fascination program. 
um, so looking at that impact, the capacity and ongoing monitoring of the program. It's a really well established program that's had some great impacts over time. And this is a really good opportunity to reflect on that and keep building. Um, the second work package, by contrast, is a very new idea that's come through the disaster challenge as proposed by Mark and Kamara, who won the disaster challenge last year with their idea of being able to reach tourists, tourists and tourism workers through use of Wi-Fi captive portals to deliver um, messaging on different risks that they'd be facing in their environment. Traditionally, a group that quite hard to reach. Um, this is a great innovative idea that they came up with. Uh, right for you know and justifiably um, won the disaster challenge but noting that the next step is to really pilot that program um, uh, develop it develop the videos to support it and Kamara will explain more about the um, about how it works later and really collaborate with local government and other stakeholders to see those that implemented as a pilot assess and see how that could be iterated and scaled into the future and the idea is that with those two contrasting work packages that have a very heavy monitoring and evaluation component, um, that we can help inform uh, monitoring and evaluation framework. So really an outcomes-based standard that we can have for the evaluation of risk prevention programs uh, more broadly. And I'll go into a bit more around the history of that and why that's important or how that scales with the back of these two work packages after um, uh, after Kamara and Chris and team have had an opportunity to present on their respective programs. So um, what we'll do is we'll start off with work package one. So that's fight fire fascination. So Chris and team, I'm going to hand over to yourselves to speak a bit to this. I might stop sharing and Ethel, if we could just pin them so we can see them uh, nice and clearly, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, so I'll start with the, the history. So the Fight Fire Fascination Program is an initiative of QFES firefighters. Um, it was designed to support parents, guardians with their efforts to educate children about fire and about safe fire behaviour. We use empowerment and education as a tool to um, help young people learn the skills to remain safe from fire. It's actually a really big piece of that. Um, this is achieved through a series of visits to the home or a safe space. Not everyone's home environment is um, conducive to good outcomes. Um, so we go through a series of visits, one to five, depends on the needs of the young person. Uh, it starts off with an inquiry. So people, the, the members of the public, put an inquiry into us, give us a bit of an outline of what's happened, why they're concerned about this fire behaviour. We'll allocate the case out to a practitioner based on a number of factors, one being geographic location, like Queensland's a very large state. Um, so we wanna, you know, people have to travel to do it because face-to-face is a very powerful component of this program. Um, the other piece, uh, and then, sorry, and then it goes on to visits. So it depends on it. The first visit's always rapport building. We just spend time getting to know the young person, getting to understand them and their needs so we can tailor the next couple of um, visits around them. Um, so rapport building is a very fundamental piece of what we do. Um, build that rapport and then bring education and empowerment into it. We've got a whole toolkit um, that we use. There's, there's about six different strategies that we use to do that. Depends on the young people, depends on their age and their ability to process information as well. Like someone who's a bit more neurodivergent, for example, they might be 18 years old, but they've got the capacity of someone who might be 12 years old. So we've got to tailor that messaging for that young person to make sure it has has it um, and then if they're successful and we see a reduction in their unsafe fire behavior we finish with a celebration phase um, we're very fortunate we have fire trucks available to us so we can take these young people out and, and have a fabulous day at the fire station with them to celebrate their successes um, and really try and set them off on that that successful pathway i think that's a really important piece um, of that positive reinforcement is, is really what we're focusing on there. Um, so that's the young person. We also have the firefighters actually get a sense of fulfillment out of it too, because they're giving back. Like as a firefighter, we see um, the end result of people's poor choices. So this is a real opportunity for us to come back and, and be contributing to better outcomes for young people and stopping that unsafe fire behavior um, because it's, 
you know, that can be quite traumatic on a number of levels, especially in some of your smaller communities, you know, can have this ripple effect is, is one of the words, one of the strategies that we utilize. Um, and that can really impact a, a large number of people really quickly, easily. Um, the other really interesting point is it's not an isolated, like when we respond to a fire, for example, uh, we rock up, we put the fire out, we go home, see you later. Whereas this, this is a lot more touch points along the way. I think we spend around about 10 hours with the young person. Um, so we have those touch points, which allows us to build that rapport and allows us to um, deliver that education so we can have that attitudinal change, what we're looking for. Um, the Triple F program goes back to 1994. Um, it started when a uh, district officer in Kuroi um, found a fire setter and we're like, we have to do better for this. Um, so they started throughout it, they started just doing their best. And they had monthly visits with the firefighters, with the fire setter, correction, and their mental health carer, just to try and work out the best course of action. They went through this adopting, adopter fiery approach, which is still sort of what we do now. Um, we adopt them and we'll allocate them out to people so you have that close network with them. Um, and then it's just grown from strength to strength. We had some research done in 1997, um, another some um, done in 2001, um, but that was more around, you know, how do people perceive us um, and what, you know, people love fireys generally and they tell us that we're great and that's really great, but we want to see that attitudinal change and that, um, you know, that longitudinal change of behaviour is really important. Um, in 2012, due to a government decision at the time, the program was ceased and it got recommenced in 2016. So we had a four-year window where the program wasn't around. Um, some of the interesting highlights that I'll go through, in 1998, we got up to 100 young people. So from 94 to 98, we had 100 young people through there. And now we're hitting about 77 to 85 a year. Um, the program's built on Ben Furman's Kid Skills, um, book is actually where the fundamental piece of it, and that's where that, um, you know, turning problems into skills is a really powerful um, piece for that. We've done a lot of AFAC work over the years. Um, we really, really important that we share our knowledge with other um, AFAC members, other AFAC agencies, because we all have the similar sort of um, challenges and concerns and, and you know, someone's home environment isn't determined by a boundary that we create on a map, um, being Queensland in this example, you know, someone moves from Queensland and goes to New South Wales, it's really important that um, we can continue providing that family with the needs as they go through. I think that's a pretty big high overview, Jimmy, isn't it? Pretty good. That's enough to start with, yeah. <laughs> I'll hand it back to you, George. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. And what I'll say to people online today, feel free to just drop questions in the chat as you go, but we will hold off till the end. Um, I might just ask quickly, though, Chris, from your perspective and yours and the teams, you know, for you, where's the having this evaluation? What's that opportunity for yourselves? Just to highlight that a bit more, because I think it's really? a great history of the program. Yeah. Great history. Uh, uh, what my I really want to know is, does it work? Are we doing the right thing? Are we actually investing our time and our efforts in something that makes a difference, um, something that does actually have attitudinal change around it? Um, that's really fundamentally what I would like yeah. to see from this. Great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's just a good way to sort of take, cap it off in terms of where we're going with the with this particular program of work. So thanks for taking the time to share that team and thanks for being there for the questions later. Um, Kamara, I might hand over to you now. I'll share my screen if you're happy. Thanks, George. Um, so the, this whole kind of concept or idea kind of emerged in around uh, mid-2022 when Mark Owen, so Mark's Commander Alpine with CFA Victoria, all around um, awesome guy. So I'll give him an introduction that way. I hope that's suitable introduction, Mark. <laughs> um, so Mark and I were kind of uh, discussing evidence-based approaches to community risk reduction, particularly in relation to transient communities, specifically tourists and tourism workers, because in Mark's area in the Alpine region of Victoria, um, he sees a huge influx of tourists and tourism workers at certain periods of time of the year. And he was interested in learning more about what evidence-based approaches might have existed that were applicable to his area. 
Um, so he touched base with me and we had a few discussions. Um, and I, throughout those discussions, we realized that there really was a gap in knowledge and practice concerned with disaster and emergency prevention and preparedness for transient communities. Um, so as George kind of alluded to at the beginning uh, of the introduction, really existing approaches have been designed for householders, for school children, for other types of permanent and regular residents or workers. Um, but these approaches are not really or necessarily translatable to transient populations. So, you know, from an emergency services perspective, we know that when people visit an area temporarily, there are limited avenues for us to engage with them. So, you know, transient communities might lack interest and knowledge of educational or information sources. They have unstructured routines, so they're really difficult for us to access. They may speak a language other than English. Um, they often remain unaware of the place and time-based factors influencing risk, don't have accurate perceptions of risk, and don't really know what to do in the event of an emergency. So we floated a few ideas, but the one that resonated um, with us was this concept of using videos embedded in Wi-Fi captive portals. And then it just happened that around that time, NHRA launched their disaster challenge, and their wicked problem was how can disaster preparation engage with the unengaged, the moving, or the hard to reach? So we thought our Wi-Fi idea uh, might have some potential. So we submitted it to the challenge and were lucky enough to be selected as a winning entry. And as a result, submitted this project concept to NHRA. Uh, and here we are. So our idea in essence is to basically use Wi-Fi captive portals to play short videos to tourists and tourism workers to enhance disaster prevention and preparedness using messaging that is specific to the temporal and geographical risks in particular locations at specific times. So when individuals log into a Wi-Fi network for the first time, they'll be required to view a short video before gaining full access to the network. And the content of that video is gonna be tailored to the disaster risk. Um, next slide, please, George. So captive portals are web pages that users must view and interact with before accessing a Wi-Fi network. They usually contain an ad that has to be viewed or clicked through before you're able to access the internet. So captive portals have already been used to influence user behavior, but the focus has been on enticing you to buy a product or a service. So we know free Wi-Fi is you know, really common. We know captive portals are common. We know that they've already been used to influence user behavior, but what they haven't been used for is to communicate disaster prevention and preparedness information. So we thought this was a really great opportunity um, because the way that the captive portals work mean that messaging can be specific, measured and timely. Next slide. We want to use a series of short videos that are embedded in these Wi-Fi captive portals to make people feel inspired to reduce disaster risk. So the videos we hope will show relatable people taking simple evidence-based proactive actions that reduce the risks and consequences of disasters as part of the normal everyday activities of tourists and tourism workers. So we really wanna try to normalize these behaviors. Each video in the series will just show a family or a group visiting different areas of Australia at different times of the year. And while traveling, these people will take the actions to increase their preparedness for disasters specific to that time and place. Next slide. We also, we think it's really important that each video highlights local tourism hotspots and activities while reflecting a really positive holiday vibe. This is really important and I think one of the unique kind of components of our concept. Um, so we know that the evidence tells us that people are motivated more by positive examples than they are by fear and we think this is particularly applicable to tourists and tourism workers. So you know when people are on holiday even a working holiday, they generally just want to have fun, relax, see the sights, have a positive experience. So for these videos to actually attract attention, maintain interest and engagement, and ultimately, hopefully, you know, instigate behavioural change, we think they need to reflect and tap into the positive holiday vibe. We also need the videos to be uploaded into the captive portals of local businesses and councils or state government. So it's really important that these videos are good for business and good for the local area. So we developed a sample video um, that, yeah, we'll play for you today. And it just shows a family of tourists visiting a holiday park. They access the accommodation Wi-Fi network, watch an example of a disaster education video. And then after watching the video, it just shows them implementing the behaviours that they've observed.
south coast, it's going to be calm and mild, temperatures in the mid-20s and no wind. Tune in at 2 p.m. to our local. So that video was obviously about bushfire Sorry. prevention and preparedness, um, but the videos can be used to educate people about disasters, any type of disaster of any scale in any location at any time of the year. So um, the great thing about them is that uh, Wi-Fi captive portals can, you know, the technology is scalable from a single building to a large area. So they can be used by networks of local businesses in a small town to target the risk of landslide after heavy rain by local government to target heat waves in inner urban areas, by networks of state governments to target flooding along the east coast of Australia, the potential is endless. Um, captive portals can also be used by airports, airlines, buses, other means of transport to communicate messaging that's relevant to a particular destination. Uh, so the approach is also highly adaptable. Our next slide, please, George. Um, captive portals can select videos by time and place. They automatically personalize based on the language settings on the device. They can ask basic information such as age and can play videos that are tailored to demographic needs. They identify the IP address of the user, meaning we can choose whether to play a video only once when a user logs on for the first time to avoid viewer fatigue or to play different videos every time the user logs on to address multiple risks. The videos will be highly visual with limited spoken word as you just saw. And we did this to ensure that uh, the video can be understood by people with lower levels of literacy who have hearing impairments by people who speak English as a second language or not at all. And where people have uh, are blind or if they have low vision, the captive portal can also use existing voice enabling software on the user's device. So during the 2019-20 bushfire crisis, uh, next slide, thanks George, tens of thousands of tourists were trapped by fires on the east coast of Australia. Service stations ran out of fuel, supermarkets ran out of food, power was cut, mobile phone services stopped working. Our idea, we hope, can help get preparedness information out to more people before events like Black Summer occur, giving people a higher capacity to anticipate and respond to disasters. So a high level of preparedness relieves pressure on emergency services, so it makes our job a lot easier. It relieves pressure on local communities, so they can focus on leaving early or, or protecting their properties. And it also relieves pressure on critical infrastructure and all of that collectively enhances our efforts to respond to disasters when they do occur. So we're hoping that the pilot project will empirically evaluate the effectiveness of Wi-Fi captive portals in preparing tourists and tourism workers for disasters. I didn't want to say too much about our pilot testing ideas. We have a few, but we know, you know, and I'm sure that there are experts in this room or who are, who are interested in applying, who have a lot of um, kind of experience in this space. Um, but if it is found to be effective, we really hope that, you know, emergency disaster tourism stakeholders, you know, will be interested in funding and implementing this idea. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kamara, for taking the time to present that and, um, yeah, providing a bit more detail and a really awesome concept. So, um, yeah, I always enjoy watching you present and uh, shame yeah, we couldn't get Mark with you this time, but you're a good double act when you do do it. So let's give you a bit of overview of work packages one and two, um, everyone online. But I just wanted to speak quickly to um, the work, third work package coming out of that. So 
The first thing to note is that both those work packages themselves have been identified as being inherently valuable, just in terms of, in one case, really understanding the impact of a great historically established program, and in the other, evaluating and understanding the potential of a really interesting or, you know, really potentially impactful idea and be able to inform and develop that and iterate it over time so it can scale. But um, the hope is by having those two contrasting work packages or case studies effectively, it's a really good opportunity to help develop what we would frame as a framework or an outcomes based standard for the evaluation of risk prevention programs more broadly. So there are risk prevention programs come in a number of different shapes and sizes. They can be either well established or there may be new things that different agencies are trying. But one thing we know is that we haven't really got that kind of standard, standard or framework on how to evaluate those consistently. And that's really a missed opportunity in many ways, just because a, it's reliant on practitioners uh, upskilling themselves around monitoring and evaluation, and some people feel more or less comfortable with that, um, to evaluate how those programs are going. Um, but also, it's just not necessarily the tools or training available to help with that. And we know it's really important because it enables so many things. So having that ability to capture data, learn from it, learning cycles enables uh, program refinement, it enables knowledge sharing between jurisdictions and the successful scaling of different programs. And it also helps, you know, when there are changes at different levels, um, justify the ongoing program. So if people come in, they're looking at new ideas, be able to show where well, we know it has that kind of impact is really important. And we've seen some really good documents around the importance of evaluation and community engagement and risk prevention programs more broadly, but they don't necessarily have the kind of concrete examples you'd be working to here. So it's a really rich opportunity to take two contrasting case studies to be able to demonstrate, showcase um, what good monitoring and evaluation looks like and familiarize that with the broader community of um, Australian pra practitioners and risk prevention programs. So with that, you know, there's one thing to develop a framework or a standard, but also proposing how would you empower people to respond to those standards as well is important. So you don't want to be setting the bar and then not providing those materials to help with it. And that's what where package three really comes in. It's really trying to um, socialize what we've learned from that process of those two work packages to look at how risk prevention programs across a broad range of risk can be successfully evaluated, how that knowledge can be shared between jurisdictions. Um, and that would be a really core part of um, this, this overall project. And given that there are those different components to it, we are seeing it as a longer term program of work really. So the, the total maximum budget has been uh, allocated as half a million dollars. Um, and noting that within that, we're assessing EOIs that come in on value for money and justification for the funds requested. So I wanna see how you'd be looking to spend that to answer the different components of the work that you'd be working on. Um, and it is, we see it as a longer term piece. So even those two work packages, you may be able to run them in parallel, but that socialization of what you're learning from it and actually getting to a really good framework or st outcomes based standard um, would take longer. So we're seeing it would take a few years for this one. Um, and in terms of the governance, you know, we've heard some from some great end users here and actually I haven't successfully introduced Mike, Carol, <laughs> and others who've also joined the call and are here to help answer questions, but um, have helped brief this in. Um, in terms of governance, you know, the contract would be with ourselves, Natural Hazards Research Australia, and we look for one lead provider, even if you're in a consortium. But we would form a project management committee and a technical working group. So really, we've got that voice of the end users involved, so we can actually understand, A, are we hitting the right marks, the fight fire fascination, the Wi-Fi captive portals, but also from others that might be able to help assist and get invested in the broader work package three as well. So other stakeholders in the community engagement, technical working group, or AFAC, whoever it might be, they form a critical element of the governance to help inform project direction, provide advice, identify those really strong utilization opportunities beyond the first two work packages as well. And we'd look to meet regularly. So those of you that worked with us before will be familiar with that structure. And there we do have a, a reporting structure. Most of that's in the in the EOI. So I'm not going to spend too long on that. But I was I think the governance component was really important. But stakeholder presentation is just going to be absolutely key with this one because we do want this to be in particular with work package three. A is good to help other jurisdictions understand how both these have gone, but then also what work package three looks like requires that socialization. 
the process, is, all the information on the process itself is available on the website and the links are in this slide. But key information is if you are looking to put in your proposals, please put those in by 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'm sure daylight time is fine, actually, but I'll just double check with the team on Monday, 30th of October. I know that sounds funny, but I know it does happen. <laughs> but the extra hour is, uh, okay, I actually think Australian Eastern Standard Time is more generous than keep at it. So hopefully that's fine. And um, I'm not going to go too much into making a submission. That's all in the EOI as well. I do want to allow plenty of time for questions. And we're hitting the only 20 minutes left mark for that. But the evaluation criteria are all in there, hopefully well explained. But we have that up front just so you can think about that when you're and use that to inform what you put in your proposal when you submit those. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks to everyone for joining. This is now really an opportunity to ask questions. So this is the this is the meat of it. But thanks again to uh, Kamara, um, Chris, and team for uh, taking a bit of time to talk to these. And then please stick around because this is the bit where we get the curly questions. Hopefully, if you have them, to researchers online. Um, but appreciate you taking the time out to be at the briefing today as well and pre um, prepare those presentations. If you do have questions feel comfortable being on the recording you can put them in the chat like I said otherwise feel free to just jump off or put your hands up if you know how to do that and I'll call you out and we can we can just get you off um mute and camera to have a chat fantastic well firstly can I just say fantastic presentations I don't see how you could get anything better than what Kamara was presenting on the wi-fi area I thought it was brilliant <laughs> so congratulations it's really good um I, I guess I'm looking at doing this in conjunction with the, I, I noticed she's not here today, that it was Ansi Gamage from Victoria University, sorry, from RMIT, but mm. there, there was a group of people actually from Victoria. So I, so I would probably apply in conjunction with, with them. Um, I, I just, I got the impression you're looking obviously at a teaching package of some sort, particularly in your option three. Mm. Um, yeah. And, I, I guess my, my question is, is really, do you want that as visual as the sort of thing that Kamara presented? I think that's a really great question, David. And part of it, um, and I'd like to hear from others actually around this as well. I've done this kind of evaluation training before and mm. basically my recommendation, this is where we'd have really active end user engagement for their advice as well, David. So we'd expect that to help inform it because we want it to be... Yeah. You know, end user insight led, I would say. Um, okay. But going for something that's accessible to the people, that are, you know, the practitioners mm. is the key. And that looks a bit different from place to place, right? But the way I always used to challenge people that I was developing these trainings with was um, like making it more visual or as accessible as possible doesn't alienate anyone necessarily it just means more yeah. people can access it and use it so um that's my thought on that one just but, just, yeah, just as good. a follow-up as well too I, I actually on on the 20 uh on the 20th of september uh i was involved in organizing a a youtube thing which was done through the world tourism network and we actually had 14 speakers from about six or seven different countries talk about different types of crises um mm -hmm. Many of them were actually contributors to, to the book that I've got coming out uh, next year. Uh, and it was fantastic because each, each speaker had a very different topic. So one would talk about floods, one would talk about bushfires, one would talk about uh, avalanches. I mean, it was quite extraordinary that we had this, this collection of expertise. And we also looked at um, one organisation which is actually based in Bournemouth, um, university which is their center for disaster management we actually had the director as one of our speakers and what they do and, and i guess i'm just wondering in terms of what you want to do is uh he talked about the work they did in in doing simulation games with business organizations so that not only do they have a crisis manual but they actually know exactly what to do to respond to a specific type of crisis would would you be interested in having some of those things as part of a um, part of a, a review and monitoring and manual. I think it's an interesting one, David. So I need to have more of a think about how how that would look within the context of this. But I know that kind of um, scenario based um, 
uh, sort of understanding is really powerful, right? Because it's one of those ways. The way I've heard it explained with, I think more specifically around wargaming is that you don't know, you can't make sit down and make a list of what you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't see, I guess, others on the call, because we've. I should mention that we're also joined by uh, Nicola Moore and Kat Haynes, who are two to the node research managers have been working very closely with Kamara and Chris over time as well and Mike at QFest. So uh, if, you, if you had reflections on it, team, I'd be interested to hear it. But I think it'd be interesting to explore what that looks like. And I think with this um, project in particular, there's opportunities to make it obviously within the confines of what you can achieve within the budget, right? You can have the initial one, but there'll be that process of actually engaging with end users to understand what would help get them something they can actually use and is practical. So uh, to evaluate the work that they're doing. Um, with the with the work package two, for example, it's a evaluation of the pilot. We do want that, you know, there's an approach that's been identified that we want to pilot before iterating it, I would say. Uh, Kamara would be interested in your thoughts on it. So really getting those videos there and trying to understand what the impacts of them were before we start taking down the route of uh, looking at alternative delivery models. But maybe within the, the 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 work package three, there'd be more latitude within that for that sort of co-design or that design of the end users. Sorry, David, I don't maybe because I couldn't I need time to digest how you would actively implement that kind of scenario planning within the evaluation component or work package three. Um that's where my head was going. But interesting to hear about that experience with Bournemouth and any lessons learned ultimately around good, effective ways to communicate something that's going to be usable to practitioners in that instance is great. Um, similarly, I think Mark and Kamara did a lot of the legwork when they put together the, the idea around the Wi-Fi captive portals, which is why the proof of concept is so strong. You know, that video, so that style, they've done a lot of that background thinking and trying to think to it. So I would suggest we sort of would want to do something in line with that because we want to test the concept ultimately before we start to refine it. But um, yeah, that might be sort of good recommendations for next steps. So um, how's my driving team? Is Kamara or Nicola or Kat, was there anything you wanted to add to that? David, from your perspective, how satisfactory an answer was? <laughs> oh, look, I, th no, I think your answer was absolutely, it was beautiful actually. And, and it's been a really good briefing session because I was a bit naughty and didn't do a lot of the reading before. So I sort of understand where you're all coming from now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually, actually, Ansi, who suggested that I come on in on this one, I, I thought she'd be here as well too. But at least I can brief her about your briefing, so it's uh, it's great. <laughs> I, I'm starting to see what the strategy might have been, David. <laughs> it's like if I get David to go. Um, no, I think I'm glad to hear it's been really useful. And um, yeah, it's been great. Not wanting to describe all my colleagues as horses, but hearing from the horses <laughs> can be better with some of these things. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad that was helpful. But again, if there are follow up questions, you can always put them in the email or we still have sure. time now as well. So sure. uh, any emails you want to send to the team. And uh, yeah, Nicola sort of reiterated something that I was saying there. So we'd be interested in approaches to work package three that really develop with those end users. And uh, Nicola, I saw your other message. I was thinking that having some representation from the AFAC Community Engagement Technical Working Group would be really relevant here. And we've already actually introduced some of this project to that group um, to establish that there's that, that appetite. So yeah, lots of good opportunity for co-design within that. So thanks for the question, David. I think it's a really great one to, and it's lovely right. to hear how you're thinking about it. Um, <laughs> So uh, others on the call, were there any other questions that were in front of mind for you that you'd like to answer while we're online? Hi. I have not so much a question, but I just thought I'd throw this in. Um, I'm from QFS Research and Innovation, and I'm probably in the unique position of having worked with Kamara and Mark, um, Chris and the team, and also, you know, George and the NHRA team. The opportunity is a fantastic one that we are looking on with great interest. Um, it's genuine. And I like the idea of looking at a very established program like Triple F versus a very new innovative idea like the Wi Fi's portal. And we can really see value in that general third work package of looking at that framework and standard around, you know, looking at different programs and initiatives that, that come our way. So it is a great opportunity. It's a genuine one, and we are genuinely interested. I would encourage people to apply. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I love the plug. So yeah, I think um, 
great to highlight that. And I think um, what I found uh, lovely about this and other projects to work on is that uh, end user investment and understanding and really evaluating how these programs are working or not and creating that learning cycle where you really are continuing to continuing to grow the impact of the program through insight generated. It would be really interesting to see what a research team could bring in in terms of tools that might not have been used yet that create a really rich understanding. I think one of the things that Chris, maybe we were discussing or Chris and Mike, was that actually there's a sense that bike fire fascination has had a number, number of other unintended good consequences to it or knock on impacts. So, and that's not saying it's actually that easy to capture just through ongoing monitoring. It only really comes up through a really rich evaluation process. So what are the kind of tools that we can use as a sector to do that and help understand where we are getting those rich other outcomes and be able to capture that? Because they may be things that you either want to consider, oh, how do we build that up in the program moving forwards? If it's if we're seeing knock-on effects on someone's leadership capacity or whatever it might be. So, and there's some really great tools out there that we're using in the international development sector, but other places that are quite like touch, like photo voice or other things um, that you could use to do that. But how do you communicate those in a way that um, people can just pick them up, run with it, use it to refine their program, use it to share their program uh, is really key. But Mike, thank you for the plug. And like I said, I think it's um, just reiterating, it's really great to see agencies investing time and energy in these spaces. So it's not true everywhere it's been in other sectors I've worked in. So yeah, it's great to see here. <laughs> I might have to raise the gavel soon. It's going to be a going, going, gone. But noting that it's not speak now, forever hold your peace. There are opportunities to speak up. And David, I can see you. you're going to squeak one in there. Go, yeah, go for it. Yeah, just a very quick one. Uh, is, uh, do you insist on all the all the people who are perhaps putting bids in there to to be purely Australian, you're happy to have any inter international people? Ah, now that's a good question. I think there is, this is where I'll show my limitations of knowledge, but my understanding is that I've worked, I'm actually working currently through other components of the program with um, agencies overseas just because um, they, they are the ones that have the capacity to do the research, right? So... Mm. Nicola or Kat, I'm just wondering if there are um, equivalencies through the core program or anything that I might be missing, because I think ultimately if we can get it to work and get it contracted, usually it's sort of like you might have an Australian lead agency, but you might subcontract um, just to keep things simpler. But um, yeah, I don't know if you, I yeah. might not have a really good answer to that one. Yeah, we've got plenty of talent here in Australia. That's not the issue, yeah. but but sometimes it's sometimes it can be valuable. Uh, okay. I've done a lot of work with people in Japan and they do some terrific stuff over there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I said, I think I'm trying not to answer my previous hat on because I've worked with researchers in Nepal and Japan and others on seismic resistance. Mm. So, but um, Nicola's answered in the, in the chat and thanks, Nicola. It's also a frequently asked question. Sorry, I should know this better. But yeah. Um, Basically, we're unable to directly contract with overseas researchers. So okay, my understanding fine. of that is that that doesn't mean they couldn't be involved, but it might need to be a subcontract with the lead agency to make that work. So, And that would be the sort of responsibility of the lead agency to have that. But the lead agency has to be Australian. So okay. uh, it's my reading of that. Yeah, international research teams can be research, part of research projects on a sub consortium. Thank you. <laughs> there was another Hi. question. Hi, um, Tamara. There was another question uh, just up above Nicola's response. Ah, okay, cool. Just uh, The question is around question of priority for the budget that is available. Would you say the case study outcomes framework and training components are equally important? Which component would you anticipate absorbs the most budget? Engaging your practitioners on training can be time consuming. So I think developing that component will require um, uh, will require investment, right? But I wouldn't say we haven't thought ahead around there's a priority for this budget or not. That's something we'd look for your recommendation on and be keen to see what you would say um, is going to be important. So ultimately, the budget should be distributed to achieve the outcomes we're hoping to. So we don't want to cut down in one area. Uh, at the cost of actually, for example, having a successful pilot or whatever it might be. And then actually that would interfere with the outcomes of work package three. So it's not an easy question to answer. And we'd be looking for 
your sense of how much it would take you to do to hit those goals as we go through it's hard for me to go it's going to be this this or this i'm sorry that's not a great answer but um yeah it can be time consuming and we would um we would invite you to highlight how much you would be looking to spend on that stakeholder engagement realistically noting that there are opportunities already through things like the project management committee and work package three but yeah um would you be wanting to do things face to face online and um, that also helps us there in our assessment but i'm sorry i can't give you we had some gone it should be this much for this component this much for this component so um yeah that's and something we're looking for guidance on often in the EOI in terms of what you'd see would be important um, thank you. Yeah, sorry, it's not a, a, a clear response in that way, but it's entirely open to open to where you'd see different money being required to help achieve those objectives. Uh, unless, uh, Kat Nicole, <laughs> you're going, what do you mean? We said this much. But um, no, we hadn't anticipated like splitting it up quite that cleanly for this. Um, like I said, we'll be guided by what you put in. Thanks, team. I think we're going to call it there, but please, you can get in touch via email if you have additional questions. Like I said, they'll be shared, but I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with in your submissions. And um, thanks again, A, to everyone from, from uh, QFES and Kamara and Mark for being online. Um, and yeah, to yourselves for being here for the briefing as well. It's great to see your sort of engagement and yeah, uh, happiness to get stuck in uh, and understand more about the project and really I I love this project and really looking forward to seeing what we can work on together so um, good luck with the process and thanks again team have a great rest of your day <laughs>